Our reading comes from Matthew chapter 2, the second chapter of Matthew. The reading will be projected on the screens behind me. We'll read the first 12 verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We, have seen his, or we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Dearly loved people of God, as you know, between Christmas and New Year, I was kind of ill. And so I spent more time than usual watching hockey. I caught some of the Spangler Cup and all of Team Canada's games at the World Junior Championship, including the one in which they got scored on in the last minute of the third period to send it over into overtime, which... Well, you know how that stopped, how that ended. But those teenagers and young adults, they're crushed at that loss to the Finns. They were enormously invested in this tournament. It's an honor to be named to Team Canada, but it also calls for a big commitment. Those guys make huge amounts of a huge investments of time and effort to be part of that team. I was impressed as well by the commitment of the families. Parents and guardians support their kids to get them to that level. And then when they do make the team and go to a big tournament like that, they travel along with them all the way to BC, paying for travel and paying for hotels, food, attending the games. It's big. A big commitment. I was even impressed by the commitment of the fans. Some of the Canadians traveled to Davos, Davos, Switzerland. They do it every Christmas to go there and to watch the Spangler Cup every single year. It's their Christmas tradition, according to the interviews I saw. What a big investment to watch some hockey. Before I start pointing fingers too far, I can even include myself in that. They are sitting in an easy chair, paying for cable TV in order to invest three hours to watch a hockey game. Even that's a pretty big investment, isn't it? Afterwards, you kind of look at it and say, well, after that kind of a game, was it worth the time? Was it worth the emotional investment? The letdown? Uh, maybe sports aren't that important to you. Maybe there's something else, though, that really revs your engine. What does grab your attention? 
Where do you invest your time, your emotions? Is there anything that you'd be willing to travel halfway across the continent to go be part of? Anything you'd be willing to travel across the ocean to witness, to experience? We just read a few verses from the Gospel according to Matthew. This Gospel was written for Jesus' disciple disciples in the decades after Jesus' death, after His resurrection, after His ascension into heaven. This gospel was written for the Jews and the Gentiles who put everything on the line because of their allegiance to Jesus as the Messiah, to Jesus as the King. Some of them uprooted their families from centuries of living in Jerusalem because the persecution was so bad there, they just got out of town. Some lost their power, their prestige, their position in the community because they valued citizenship in the kingdom of God as higher than anything else in the world to them. You see, Matthew's first readers were not the first and they won't be the last to stake so much on God's covenant promises. Each generation, each family, each individual is called to make a choice about what's most important in their life. Will they bow to Jesus and put all their treasure at His disposal? As Matthew retells what happened after Jesus was born, he records events in nature, events in the sky and the earth that demonstrate the cosmic importance of the coming of the Son of God into his own creation. This is a ruler who's come to shepherd God's people and that has significance for all corners of the world. And the earth seems to react. If the stars and the angels shouted at creation as God mentioned to Job while he was giving him a talking to in the end of the book of Job. If they shouted for joy, why wouldn't there be a new star in the heavens when God humbled himself, became a man within his own creation? This is the kind of stuff that Matthew really likes. He loves telling about what happens in creation in response to what God is doing. He delights in telling how nature responds to Christ, the King, and His saving work. And so here at Jesus' birth, a star is born when Christ is born. But he also describes stuff in nature when Christ is crucified, when Jesus rises again. You see, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, when Christ endured the punishment that I deserve, that you deserve, Matthew describes how the sky grew dark, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness cold came over the whole land. The disappearance of light in Jesus' crucifixion echoed God's withdrawal of His love and His grace to His dearly loved Son. That darkness for three hours was part of Jesus' suffering on our behalf. And at his death, once Jesus had suffered the punishment for sin for humankind, Jesus cried out and he gave up his spirit in Matthew's gospel. And again, creation reacted. The earth shook, rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. You see? The earth reacts and responds to the marvelous things that God is doing through Jesus Christ. Signs and wonders accompany God's redeeming work. And it doesn't end there. When Christ Jesus rose from the tomb, when he was victorious over sin and over death, when he came out as the firstborn over all creation, there were more signs in nature. Matthew tells us how there was a violent earthquake. 
For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. He opened it up so people could see that Christ was no longer there. He had died, had been buried, but he rose again. And all creation changed. You see, Matthew delights to see how the natural phenomena occurs in conjunction with God's redemption of the world. And so here at Jesus' birth, this star appears. From the east, people were watching the sky. These magi saw the star and they responded. Who are magi? Well, these are the astronomers, the astrologers in the tradition of the magicians and soothsayers of the Persian Empire. During the Babylonian captivity, when Daniel and his friends had been taken from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon and worked in the courts of the kings of their captivity, they rubbed shoulders in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Darius with magi like this, truth-tellers, astronomers, astrologers. And it's interesting that they show up here Because the Magi aren't the type of people that the high priests and teachers of the law would invite and say, come on, come to our synagogue. Let's listen to what you have to say. They weren't involved in practices that most Christians would say, yeah, that's kind of cool. No, most of us would kind of tisk tisk and say, what? And yet God invited these Magi to come with a star God alerted them to the birth of the King of the Jews. He alerted them to the coming of the Savior into the world. They read of God's marvelous deeds in the book of nature, and they couldn't stay away. The Magi had to accept this invitation to come and marvel at what God was doing in the world, for the world. And so the Magi invested in this trip to Bethlehem to see this thing that happened that the Lord had told them about. They saddled up for the journey and came looking for the king of the Jews so that they could bow down and worship, so that they could put their treasures at his feet. And at journey's end, when they saw the star in the sky above the place where the child and his mother were, they were overjoyed. They were filled with great joy. They rejoiced greatly with great joy. The Greek underlines and emphasizes there was joy there. And that's what the Magi felt when they finally saw the Lord, the King, the Redeemer. So, what are Magi doing in the Bible? Well, Matthew presents Magi in contrast to King Herod. Herod was a jealous king, and he lied about his desire to worship the newborn king of the Jews. When we read further in chapter 2, we find that Herod would rather kill all the boys in Bethlehem under two years of age than bow down to the real king of the Jews. Matthew presents these astronomers and astrologers from the East in contrast to the high priests and teachers of the law. Although the religious leaders knew where the Messiah was to be born, although they knew about the Magi's questions about this newborn king of the Jews, I mean, Herod and all Jerusalem was turned upside down because of the request. Now, these leaders among God's people watched as the Magi headed south to Bethlehem. They knew what was going on, but they didn't investigate any further. They let it hang. Later on during his ministry, Jesus described God's judgment on that kind of behavior. This is what it says in chapter 8. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, 
where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ouch. It's a line. A firm line drawn between those who bow down to Jesus as the Messiah, as the King, and those who refuse, who don't acknowledge His Lordship, His Kingship, His salvation. And so Matthew describes these events in the heavens and the response of the Magi in the East because of the cosmic significance of what God the Son is doing by coming into His creation for its redemption. Jesus has come to rescue those who stopped trusting, who have stopped worshiping God. Jesus has come into creation to gather together all those daughters and sons of Adam and Eve who persist in disobeying and mistrusting God and His promises. Jesus came to reclaim the allegiance of those who worship the good things of God's creation instead of worshiping the good God who created them all and who is redeeming them all. I mean, make no mistake. There's good things in this creation. Sports are good. Entertainment is pleasurable and good. Money is a blessing from the Lord. Work is designed to be fulfilling, to be rewarding, to be able to see something that you've accomplished at the end of the day, at the end of the year, at the end of the season. Leadership responsibilities are a sacred trust from God to be able to rule under God who's ruler over all, to rule under the King of the Kings. Well, that's a real privilege. But when any of these good things that God extends to us, when any of these good things becomes the most important, well, that's when it becomes a problem. When a ruler like Herod refuses to bow before Jesus as king of kings, well, then there's a problem. The exact problem that Jesus came into the world to address. Jesus came into the world to address, to rescue us from worshiping things, from worshiping idols, stuff that promises great rewards, but when put into the wrong order, leave us feeling empty and used and unfulfilled. And so it's only in kneeling before Jesus that we're lifted up as citizens of his kingdom, as daughters and sons of the king of kings. It's in worshiping Jesus as Savior and Lord that we renounce anyone and anything as most important in our lives and give our allegiance completely to Jesus as Lord. It's in putting our treasures at Jesus' feet, putting our stuff at Jesus' disposal that we're confessing that everything already belongs to God because He's the Creator. He's the Redeemer. And sure, he takes great pleasure in entrusting us with time and talents and treasure. He allows us to invest those things into his kingdom, to invest those things into loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, to invest those things in worshiping and acknowledging and praising God as Lord over everything. And if that were not enough, Many of us have been blessed with enough provisions, enough resources to find pleasure in hosting parties and dinners and celebrations throughout the holiday season. Most of us have been blessed with enough leisure time to enjoy pursuing hobbies, to being able to kick up our feet and enjoy a hockey game, to be able to enjoy enjoy recreation. God allows us to enjoy the fruit of our labors. Nice houses, good vehicles. Nice stuff. We're richly blessed by God to use our freedom in Christ to find pleasure in the goodness, in the plenty that we enjoy that comes to us from the hand of God who's generous and loving and gives with great generosity. But the question still remains, what is top 
in your life? What do you invest the most time and energy and effort into? What do you pursue relentlessly? What would you travel across the continent for? What would you travel across the ocean for? You see, this is a question of priorities. Who or what is really king in your life? In response, we're going to sing Angels from the Realms of Glory, but not that verse. We'll sing verse 3, 4, and 5 of Angels from the Realms of Glory. Sinful men, 
Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore. 